Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our today's webinar on substance use disorder in women, history, use, and treatment. We'll let folks get settled in here and we will be starting momentarily. All right, welcome again and thank you for joining us for our webinar today on substance use disorder in women, history, use, and treatment with our presenter, Ashley Yassel. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Great Lakes ATTC and SAMHSA. The Great Lakes ATTC, MHTTC, and PTTC are funded by SAMHSA under the following cooperative agreements. The views expressed in this training are the views of the speaker and do not reflect the official position of DHHS or SAMHSA. The ATTC network uses affirming language to promote the promises of recovery by advancing evidence-based and culturally informed practices. If you are having any technical issues, please individually message me, Alyssa Kuala, or Jen Winslow in the chat section, and we would be happy to assist you. If you have any questions for Ashley, please put them in the Q&A section of your toolbar. We will try to take time at the end to answer those questions. And if we do not have time to answer those questions, we will create a, a spreadsheet or a Word doc and send that out to everyone following the presentation. The recording and the PowerPoint will be made available on our website within the week. If captions or live transcript would be helpful, please locate the caption option on your Zoom toolbar. You will be directed to a short survey at the end of today's presentation, and we would greatly appreciate it if you could fill that out. And certificates of attendance will be sent out via email to all who attended the session in full. If you'd like to stay connected with the Great Lakes ATTC, follow us on Facebook, check out our LinkedIn. We have a YouTube channel and we have a podcast channel. And I'm super excited to hand this over to our presenter, Ashley Yassal. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alyssa. I will share my screen here. All right. Um, as Alyssa introduced me very nicely, thank you. And my name is Ashley Assel. I am thrilled to be here with you today to present this webinar, Substance Use Disorder and Women, History, Use, and Treatment. Um, I personally live in Cleveland, Ohio, and have a background in human resources, healthcare policy and compliance, and statistics. I have a consulting practice, Ashley Ryan Consulting, to support Favor Health Agencies with project management, compliance, and organizational development. I am also working on my Ohio licensure as a licensed chemical dependency counselor, LCDC2, um, at Catholic Charities in Cleveland. The two most essential background items that supported my research and knowledge for this presentation are that I was the executive director of a women-focused SUD outpatient facility, substance use disorder outpatient facility, excuse my acronym, but I will use that going forward. Uh, we provided wraparound support for women including child care, transportation, trauma groups, trauma therapy, and robust case management. I finished my Master of Public Administration in 2022 and compiled much of this research um, that I will present today for this presentation. And my main research project was around women's treatment and trauma. My primary connection to the disease is as an adult child. I have one parent that suffers from substance use disorder. In other words, I am recovering from being a people pleaser, a workaholic, and taking on way too much responsibility for my own good. Um, luckily, now that I don't do that, my life is much better than I am in recovery. All right, so quick polling question here. I'd love to see who is joining us today. So if you guys would take... Um, 30 seconds and please respond to the polling question. All right, looks like we have almost 70% participated. Um, almost half of you are doing direct service with both men and women, about 5% women only, 2% um, men only. 
And we have a supervisor's administrative support at 22% uh, and the 21% other. So thank you guys so much for, for that. That helps me with the presentation going forward. All right, here is the agenda for today. I will walk through women-centered treatment and SUD in women. Uh, a disclaimer here that this webinar is focused on individuals born female at birth and or those who feel comfortable in a space centered around the needs of women. I know that there is a lot of need for, um, let's see this poll came back up, sorry. And someone says they can't hear me. So I will try to speak up a little bit and we will work on that. Um, so I know that there are a lot of different genders uh, that we wanna talk about and make sure that our treatment is it caters to, um, but our system is still a binary gender system and we have created mechanisms around those. So I will just be talking about um, women compared to men today. We will also talk about the importance of trauma-informed uh, care and treatment. Uh, we will consider treatment for pregnant individuals. We will review the barriers for women, first to initiate treatment, and then gaps in existing treatment system once they enter. We will walk through some common emotional and physical experiences in treatment, and we will close today by talking about best practices. Here are the learning objectives from today. I covered them in the agenda, so feel free to quickly look over that. All right, jumping into our first topic on women-centered treatment. I have always remembered this quote from John Corlett, and he was the director of Ohio Department of Medicaid previously, and now is executive director of the Center for Community Solutions, which is a social service health economic think tank in Ohio. Um, when I started my journey early on um, in women's treatment, I met with John, and he's a very strong advocate um, for women's rights and supporting women in our community. So he had stated, helping women sustain sobriety helps communities thrive. Whenever we invest in women, the gains are much greater because of the primary role women play in families and with children. Due to our cultural socio socialization of different sexes, women's genetic makeup, and women's societal roles, we must focus on specific care that meets their needs. You, as providers and supervisors and other, um, are not only helping the women you see in front of you as a client, you are helping the children that they are trying to get custody of or currently have custody of. You're helping the parents they are caring for. You may impact the rest of their relationships since women are very, very relationship driven. All right, quick uh, overview of the history um, here on women's treatment. And uh, this does start with uh, Henrietta Cyberling and her influence in AA. Many of you that are in the program may know this already, so please bear with me here while I catch others up. And it does kind of give another female perspective for the treatment aspects of women's SUD treatment development. So Alcoholics Anonymous was founded in Akron, Ohio in 1935 by Bill Wilson, better known as Bill W., and Robert Holbrook Smith, better known as Dr. Bob. They were introduced in 1935 by Henrietta Buckler Cyberling. Henrietta was married to Fred Cyberling. She was introduced to the Oxford Group, a Christian-based faith group, in 1933. Um, and I must have pulled this from the my notes here, but the Cyberling family is known for uh, their founding of Goodyear Tire and Rubber, which many of you uh, may use on a daily basis for your car tires. Um, but Henrietta was introduced to the Oxford Group, which was a Christian-based faith group in 1933. Henrietta attempted to get Fred involved with the Oxford Group and was frustrated by his lack of interest. There are rumors that Fred uh, had alcoholism or alcohol use disorder. Um, that has not been proven. So you can see that 
Henrietta was probably very frustrated that Fred would not partake in the Oxford group. But over time, she let go of what she could not control and put the focus on herself. And many of you will recognize that it has some 12 step on her toes. Bill W. had arrived in Akron, Ohio from New York City and after a failed business deal, found himself in downtown Akron's Mayflower Hotel lobby. He did not want to go to the bar and drink, even though he was very tempted to. Through a posting on a phone booth, he ended up calling Henrietta. She invited him and connected him with Dr. Bob at her house on Mother's Day, May 15th, 1935. And after eight hours of talking, the first conversation of Spark AA took place. Founders Day is on June 10th, 1935, uh, which is when Dr. Bob took its last drink. Henrietta stayed involved and helped support the foundation of AA, even though Dr. Bob and Bill W. took the front stage of, in history after this point. Over her life, she continued to stay very involved and helped lead many people to sobriety. All right, so that was the first point in 1935. Moving on in 1939, Marty Mann became the first official woman to join Alcoholics Anonymous AA and achieve long-term sobriety. She was in New York, New York City then, and Bill W. was her sponsor. Later in life, she wrote a few books and opened up the first 12-step recovery-based treatment in Connecticut. And also in 1939, on August 18th, the first alcoholic patient, Walter B., was admitted to Akron St. Thomas by Sister Ignatia at the request of Dr. Bob. And Akron is another city in Ohio there, um, Northeast Ohio. And with this would make um, St. Thomas the first hospital in the world to treat alcoholism as a medical condition. 1941, uh, the first women all group started in Cleveland, Ohio. And the name of the group was West Side Women. And this is still in existence today. Um, even though more women began to join AA after this point, AA was mainly a group for men. Uh, addiction was still a man's disease and their wives would attend Al-Anon. The stigma of alcoholism being a man's disease also aligned with women entering the workforce from the 1930s to the 1970s. Women could conceal drinking at home much better than men could conceal drinking at work or in the public. All right, moving on to the 1970s and 1980s. The women's alcoholism movement occurred at this time period. Uh, this allowed treatment providers to focus more on women's needs. The focus on women was in response to the crisis of drug-exposed infants. By the mid-1990s, uh, only modest growth existed for women-only substance use disorder treatment caseloads. Also in the 90s, we started seeing more research for SUD in women. So, and you'll see uh, some of the initial research on the timeline. And then 2000s to today, uh, SAMHSA released TIP 51, which is addressing the specific needs of women in 2009. It has been updated five times since its, its initial print. There have been increased research focusing on women's needs, but we still have much more headway to make in this area. All right, moving on to the emotional and physical patterns of use. Um, we know that there are many emotional reasons for use, and these are just a few that I wanted to highlight. Um, especially for female clients, we know that trauma is a big factor, and we're going to talk more about that in a bit. Uh, married women ages 18 to 49 see the lowest rate of alcohol or illicit drug use or abuse. Um, than any other marital status. So they are about, they're at 4% SUD. And I'm sure this isn't surprising, um, but a history of divorce is positively associated with illicit drug use among women. Uh, so we see about 11% SUD in divorced or separated women. 16% of never married single women abuse or are dependent on substances. Um, so thinking about this, I'm like, oh, it must be isolation there. And also, uh, there is a high SUD rate in uh, women that are 15 to 25. Um, so in our culture, that may overlap with that single and never married group, too. 
So women are affected by family substance use as much as men. So this is that 50% likelihood of SUD if one parent has SUD, uh, yet there could be more shame and guilt associated with use than men. Uh, men are more likely to admit a substance use disorder versus prior trauma. Women are the opposite. So women are more likely to admit a trauma versus a substance use disorder. A study from 2007 suggested women in general were less likely to seek treatment for SUDs relative to men, um, but a 2016 study showed that adolescent females with AOD were more likely to receive treatment than adolescent males. And did want to highlight uh, sexual orientation here just because there is a high rate uh, or a higher rate of SUD and mental health issues in non cisgender, um, non heterosexual women. So minority LGBTQIA plus women experience exceptional high rates of substance use. Um, LGBTQIA women experience a much greater risk for depression, suicidal thoughts, and serious psychological distress. Transgender women in particular experience high levels of trauma and violence. Moving on to uh, the physical aspects of use, um, going to uh, substance-related and initiation here, Several studies have suggested that relative to men, a small subset of women may have a faster course of substance use disorder. I have heard this often in the field, um, but just wanted to point out that there is not a ton of uh, research to back this. It is a common misconception. Um, this is pretty well known, and it is true. Women metabolize alcohol slower than men, and this causes greater intoxication for females relative to males when the same amount of alcohol is consumed. And we're not placing blame anywhere here, but I did want to point out that uh, it is interesting that for women, initiation of substance use typically begins after an introduction of a substance by a significant relationship, such as a partner. Right, other aspects of physical use and specifically on health here, um, some substances can increase the likelihood of infertility and early onset of menopause. Uh, there is an increased risk of breast cancer associated with alcohol use. And um, these statistics are always really alarming to me. The Susan G. Komen Foundation reported that 53 studies show that with each alcoholic drink consumed daily, the relative risk for breast cancer increased by about 7%. So ultimately, women who have up to three drinks daily increase the risk of breast cancer by 21% with women who did not drink. Um, so very alarming statistics there. Um, adverse medical, psychiatric, and functioning consequences are more often severe with women with SUD also. All right, a little about um, women-centered treatment and why is it effective compared to a mixed gender setting. Uh, these are the four aspects of why, um, why it's been shown that gender-specific treatment is effective for certain types of women. And, um, you know, the first one would be focus due to the complex complexities of women and the disease. There are benefits to focusing in on the specific needs of women affected by SUD. Um, it can be done, but it is not easy to serve a female client who needs a lot of support in a mixed sex or mixed gender facility. It might even be more difficult in smaller facilities that have fewer resources to provide to their clients. Um, we will talk a little bit more about treatment barriers in a bit. Um, also, group therapy or group treatment. Most SUD treatment strongly focuses on group therapy. Um, a mentor of mine always talks about how women are relational, and that's a point for gender-specific groups being effective, especially for women with similar experiences. Women typically keep in touch and talk more with family and friends than men. Participation in gender-specific treatment is also associated with greater satisfaction, enhanced comfort, feelings of safety among women, and increased continuity of care following discharge. Um, and most importantly here is, is trauma. I probably should have put this first on the slide. 
Um, but as many as 80% of women seeking treatment for substance use disorders report a lifetime history of sexual assault, physical assault, or both. So we know that Corbid PTSD rates in this population go up to 59% with even higher lifetime rates. Um, one of the studies um, that really shows that if there is significant trauma, gender-specific treatment is effective, um, is a study that focuses on 115 women, incarcerated women, and that undergo gender-specific treatment. Um, for those with prior trauma of sexual or physical abuse, the study showed that gender-specific treatment was effective in this study. Um, for those without previous sexual or physical abuse, the outcomes were not significantly different from the mixed gender group. So again, trauma in someone's past was the main indicator um, to show that gender-specific treatment was effective. For a trauma healing environment, uh, safety is the most important aspect. Most women are traumatized by a male counterpart. So having all women facilities can create the safety aspect. I uh, do wanna have a disclaimer here and we'll talk more about it later, but you know, I've been asked in the past, oh, should you have uh, men at your facility in treatment? Um, I think absolutely, that could be a great opportunity for a, um, a client and a um, male counselor to have a um, positive relationship where that female client may have not had a positive relationship or a healthy relationship with a male counterpart in our lifetime before. So that could be a great opportunity. Um, but that male counselor needs to be trauma-informed, um, trained in trauma-informed care, uh, domestic violence, and um, women's treatment specifically. Also, uh, limited research, uh, like I said, there was that only the one study above 115 that really showed um, gender-specific treatment was effective with women with trauma. Um, a lot of the studies show that, um, let's see, a lot of the studies are either focused on uh, white affluent patients who will have a better trajectory than low income or minority clients. And this is due to social determinants of health. Um, and then these studies, if there are people of color included in them, unfortunately, they do not control for um, cultural differences within the groups. Um, and then there are only a few studies that focus on a large sample of women. Most are between 60 to 150 participants. The largest studies with thousands or millions separate women from men, but lack gender specific components. Some include more people of color, but do not account for culturally competent programming in various groups again. Um, and also many of you know that um, our uh, American models are based off of European models of care for treatment. Um, which is definitely reflected in the research. All right, moving on to uh, post-treatment and success rates. Um, sex is not a significant predictor in treatment outcomes or retention for all substances other than nicotine, uh, where some studies do show worse outcomes for women uh, versus men with nicotine addiction. Uh, current research shows uh, evidence for gender differences in a response to MAT is accumulating. Um, some studies show women are less likely to complete withdrawal management services uh, or detox. And then some research shows women have more significant increases than men in employment, recovery-oriented social support systems, and participation in self-help groups post-treatment. A study found that women have a greater reduction in levels of distress after treatment, although their overall levels of distress appear to remain consistently higher than those of their male counterparts. So I like thinking about this as the bar diagram where here's women coming in distress level, here's the man's distress level, and sure, they're decreasing, and then a woman's decrease is a little bit more, but women's distress levels are typically higher. Okay. Getting into the next section here, trauma-informed care. Right. Prior trauma. I said that this was huge for women and, and consideration in women's treatment. Um, the, popul the population you serve has a ton of trauma. 
I did this presentation for um, law enforcement this spring. So the statistic that you see up on the screen was specifically for them, but I left it because I thought it was interesting. I know a, a lot of you hear that it, when you're working with women, 80 to 90% have you know, trauma in their background. Um, and I know some of you may work with uh, women that have been incarcerated or women that are at risk of being incarcerated. So I thought I'd leave this up there. Um, trauma is typically a precursor for women with SUD compared to men um, where it occurs after the onset. So I've heard as high as 90% of women experience trauma before SUD um, versus 40% of men have trauma before the onset of substance use disorder. Um, I have not been able to find that statistic and where it is. So if anyone has seen that before, I would love to hear um, where it is. And it is better to assume that all of your current clients have trauma than not. During the assessment process, it's likely your client will not remember the trauma, not categorize an event as traumatic, um, or do not want to disclose something if they don't trust you. As a side note, studies show trauma from our previous generations can be passed down on a cellular level. So they may really not remember it if they haven't been told about the parents' or grandparents' trauma in the past. So trauma-specific impact on women, and how is it different than men? So women respond to and are affected by trauma in um, a variety of ways. And right here, we're focusing on that first bullet, the subjective piece. And based off of their histories, circumstances, and other factors, someone experience uh, traumatic stress symptoms that dissipate over time, while others are resilient to the effects of trauma and recover from it quickly. So we can't compare uh, two traumatic events that um, the same traumatic event that two clients may have and have to be non-judgmental non from client to client. Also, impaired brain functioning. Um, trauma can impact brain chemistry and cortisol levels. All of this has a long-term impact on mental and physical health. Clients uh, can be in survival mode, and that's fight or flight, fight, freeze, and fawn. Fawn is particular for females in trauma. Um, it's that people-pleasing, avoiding conflict, and caretaker mode that females tend to go into. And I'm going to skip over to the next slide quick, and then I'll go back. Um, so this graph in this figure, and I am not pretending to be a brain scientist, but at least it's a nice demonstration of how trauma affects the brain. Uh, trauma flips the typical brain development. And you'll see that on the right-hand side with the two triangles. And the brain focuses on survival, regulation, and then social, emotional, and then cognitive. Um, whereas a typical development is in the middle here. And that cognition is first, then social, emotional, then regulation, then survival mode. Um, so just keeping in mind that um, clients are, have different developmental um, brain have developed differently with their brain because of trauma they may have experienced. And as you know, if you guys do a lot of de-escalation and a lot of crisis intervention, um, these are the reasons why you can't reason with someone in crisis or someone who relapses and can't quite explain what they were thinking. All right, going back up here. Uh, number three, uh, responses to traumatic stress are adaptive. These may include withdrawing, aggression, spacing out, substance abuse, cutting, or other self-injury injury behavior. Some women develop uh, psychological disorders, including PTSD and other anxiety and mood disorders, and other women may use alcohol, tobacco, and drugs to cope with the trauma and its symptoms. Others recreate their trauma by engaging in problematic parent-child interactions, including abuse, abuse and neglect. Uh, we'll talk more about wraparound services later, but uh, it's one of the reasons why parenting classes are so important in women treatment settings and being able to offer those. Uh, the fourth one, women are twice as likely to develop PTSD than men, along with other physiological and psychological symptoms that often characterize PTSD. The experience of trauma can impact core assumptions and beliefs about self, others, and life. One study demonstrated that the severity of the effects of trauma is evident in two core beliefs identified by survivors of childhood abuse, her in recovery. Uh, their beliefs are 
uh, I am nothing, feeling it's a consequential there, and I am bad or wrong. So in both of those statements, there's a lot of shame and guilt. Um, some abusers say, you don't know how good you have it, which is prime manipulation, and uh, the perpetrator may have blamed them. You asked for it, like a form of punishment. In summary here, um, in addition to the abuse or trauma, experience that lead to feeling inconsequential, include being unprotected from danger, telling someone about the abuse, but not being believed, being told lies to conceal the abuse, and being unprepared for life transitions. This can lead to shutting down emotions and social isolation. It is essential for each part of treatment and diversion process to be trauma-informed. Uh, clients are extra sensitive, and we always need to be kinder than necessary and create a safe space for our clients. Right, Trauma-informed care reminders. And when I do this webinar in a three-and-a-half-hour format, I have a lot more time, and you guys give the, are allowed to give your input on these, but I am going to run through these for uh, this hour format. Uh, most important that I think I'm biased, but um, best staff practices that you can engage in, um, always using first and first language. I've heard people who use drugs um, or you're always safe with those suffering with SUD. Um, every person the client may interact with is calm, kind, welcoming, yet assertive. And you have may heard, but that you may have heard, but this needs to be every person within your organization, from the security guard to the receptionist. Um, everyone needs to be trained in trauma informed care and uh, make sure they know how to use de, de escalation techniques. Um, always admit your current competency, competency level, but don't let that be an excuse not to do research and uh, be able to prepare for cultural considerations for each individual client that you're serving. Always verify and validate. Do not make assumptions. Be non always be non-judgmental, empathetic, and encouraging. Um, try to avoid power dynamics. So consider meeting in a neutral space for the first encounter with a client and consider your address differences. Come to their level and meet them where they are at. And um, an example here would be taking a client to a neutral space um, versus your office for maybe the first meeting. Um, you do have some power within your own office and you're sitting behind a big desk. But if you move that space to more of a neutral space, especially for difficult conversations with clients, um, you can make them feel more welcome. Always talk clients through all of your processes, processes especially if conducting a search of the client's belongings, something that's very invasive that, you know, we know we have to do to, to protect that client and the rest of the clients. Um, but anything else that may be intrusive to them, always be careful um, with space and physical touch, but make sure you talk them through every step of the process for anything that you're doing with them. Always a great idea for women, especially to provide a variety of activities for healing. Uh, this may include music, art, recreational activities. Uh, we talked about this before, but having majority women of staff, uh, women as your staff, but having men, and if you do, making sure that they're trained appropriately. Always allow clients to give honest feedback about their care. And um, I do a lot of uh, client evaluation uh, work, and um, this is not as easy as you think, you know, making sure that it's great that you think through the process and say, can a client feel comfortable submitting negative feedback about a counselor and how are they doing that? Um, is it truly anonymous if you have a small agency? So thinking through all those things and making sure that clients can feel comfortable about giving you the feedback that you need to improve your organization. All right, moving on to best organizational practices. Uh, having an organizational structure that allows clients to access and engage with several layers of staff and administrators. So I think about this as uh, administrators managing by walking around and saying hello uh, to different clients, stopping in to the lobby and starting a conversation with a client, um, but being present um, has is a huge factor in being trauma-informed um, and giving access to 
have act, clients having access to you. Policies and procedures that provide safe and respectful employment and opportunity. Uh, creating a healthy space for interpersonal relationships. You may have all heard about the statistic of uh, if you have a best friend at work, uh, your work is, you have so much more work satisfaction. So keeping that in mind um, as you're building programming for staff and you know, with, with clients or staff finding meaning and difficulty through difficult times and, and looking at that in the positive light or looking at a silver lining. And then the four R's of trauma-informed care are realize, recognize, respond, and resist re-traumatization. Um, so thinking about this, that you know triggering is going to be inevitable, even though you want to try to minim minimize it as you can. Um, but the most important thing is to resist re-traumatization for our clients. Here are some trauma-informed care principles. And um, I won't read these to you, but the most important thing to think about here is um, always keeping the mindset of what happened to you. Uh, versus what is wrong with you for our clients. So what is the risk of not having trauma-informed care? And they're listed on the slide, and I'm going to give you a few examples of um, what we could do to not be trauma-informed. So this would be violating clients' boundaries, breaking trust, especially with unclear expectations or not following through. Chaotic treatment environment. Um, so if they're coming into the treatment environment and people are yelling and there's loud noises, you know, that could be very intimidating. A rigid policies and rules that are too difficult or do not allow someone to feel safe. So here you could look at, you know, what, you're thinking, oh, are our policies uh, too rigid? You could look at your success rates compared to others. Um, you could ask alumni if they thought the, the programming was too strenuous. Um, you could also ask those who did not complete the program about any potential barriers uh, that they had that you were not able to address. Uh, Lots of routine disruption is not great. I know it's going to happen sometimes, but trying to keep on schedule. Labeling intense rage and other feelings about the trauma is pathological. So that's a big no-no. Uh, minimizing and discrediting or ignoring the, ignoring the client's feelings or responses. Disruption of staff relationships because of stiff change, shift changes and reassignments. I know this is really difficult in the behavioral health workforce environment, but trying to minimize this as best as we can. Um, also, inconsistent enforcement of rules. And I know this is tough with turnover, um, but just making sure that as we have new employees come in, that uh, training is very consistent between all employees that are interacting with clients. And then last would be obtaining your investments in a non-private manner. So as you can see, these things can cause devastating effects to the client, their treatment, and staff. Uh, this slide um, has some possible triggers within the first 72 hours, especially for women. Um, I think about this in an inpatient or residential facility, especially where they're going to be staying with you for a long period of time. And they've either given up um, a lot to be there, or uh, they were forced to be there. So just keeping in mind um, some things to be cognizant of for women as they're entering your doors. All right, pregnancy and treatment gaps. All right, Alyssa, we are ready for our second polling question. Thank you very much. All right, I will give you guys about 30 seconds. Let's see if you're still awake and with me or not. Great. So according to SAMHSA's 2021 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, what percentage of pregnant women reported alcohol use? And I will wait until 
Let's see, we've got about 50%. A couple still coming in. Oh, great. I'm glad you guys are still here with me. 66%. All right, I'm going to end the poll and I will share the results with you. Um, so we are neck and neck at 10 and 16%, um, both with 39% of the results. The right answer is 10%. Um, so, and for alcohol, and it's 11% for all substances. So thank you guys for participating in that. Um, average of 10% for everyone, but it's, um, you know, the, the rate of pregnant females seeking treatment rose from 2% to 28% between 1992 to 2012. So huge increase there. Um, SAM says 2021 national, national survey and drug use and health reported, which you just took a pull on, 11% uh, of women reported past tobacco use. So highest there, um, second highest 10%, um, reported alcohol use. Uh, third would be 8% of pregnant women reported past illicit drug use and 7% of pregnant women reported past marijuana use. Overdose deaths uh, for pregnant women from 2017-2020 increased by 81%. Uh, the increase for non-pregnant women in that time period was 38%, so almost double um, for pregnant women there. So the effects of substance use on um, pregnancy, and I'll kind of go through some of the different um, drugs here and how they affect the baby and mom. Uh, so alcohol uh, can cause miscarriage, stillbirth, and range of lifelong physical, behavioral, and intellectual disabilities, including fecal alco fetal alcohol syndrome disorder, so FASD. This is incurable. So um, even though we have talked a lot about opioids in the recent past with the opioid e epidemic, um, alcohol is probably the biggest uh, worry for pregnant women uh, because of its effects on the baby. And nicotine uh, damages a developing baby's brain and lungs. Opioids um, can cause preterm birth, stillbirth, maternal mortality, and neonatal abstinence syndrome, NAS. Uh, in treatment, using methadone and buprenorphine can lead to NAS in a newborn, um, but NAS, so neonatal abstinence syndrome, is treatable, unlike FASD, and infants, infants can make a full recovery. Uh, marijuana, more research is needed here, but adolescent development problems uh, have been found. Some additional barriers that I want to discuss around pregnant women, um, transportation, for example, one going to receive daily methadone injections, uh, care for existing children with going to treatment, um, huge here, child care issue, uh, lack of resources uh, such as additional fetal scans, mental health services, trauma-focused treatment, and the overall need to feel safe, high risk of food and housing insecurity. So the postpartum period the, fir the first six weeks after childbirth does cause an increased stress level and presents a high relapse potential. Some women fail to seek treatment for SUD for fear of their unborn child and other children going to foster care, um, ev even if it's illegal to do so. All right, pregnancy and SUD kind of focusing here on um, birth statistics, and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecology, ACOG, and the American Society of Addiction Medicine, ASAM, recommended using MAT to treat opioid abuse in pregnancy over medically supervised withdrawal. They advocate for continued use of MAT in the postpartum period. These two organizations found a significantly high chance of relapse when pregnant women go off MAT. Combined medicine and women-specific psychotherapy are the most effective. Something to remember here, uh, bufomorphine can be sent home for daily or everyday doses, and this can result in isolation. With methadone, they do have to come in daily, so that decreases chances of the client having isolation. Uh, the study, a study released in December 2022 with over 15,000 women who used bufomorphine or methadone found that 50, 50% 50 
of the beef morphine babies had NAS compared to 69, so 69% of methadone babies. Beef morphine leads to a 10 to 20 increase in percent increase in birth weight. And as we know, birth weight is directly correlated with positive infant outcomes. Um, so beef morphine is also tied to better birth outcomes for the child. Um, there isn't, so beef morphine is better for the child, but there aren't a lot of studies that show any differences for the mother between methadone and beef morphine when she's pregnant. The anesthesia recommended for use in labor for SCD patients is nurexial. Um, yet, if someone is on buformorphine, to, they should stay on it. Buformorphine is 40 times more powerful than morphine. And that taking someone off buformorphine during surgery can harm them and put them at risk of an overdose. Um, note here, we know that rooming in with mom uh, is great and skin to skin contact can increase a child survival rate by up to 80%. There also continues to be a large stigma around women who use during pregnancy. Healthcare providers, especially maternity wards and NICUs, uh, need to have a better understanding of the disease and compassion for the individual. Uh, we have many improvements and strides to make. Um, I know some NICU doctors or some NICU nurses, um, and we've had some very heated discussions about uh, their clients that come in with substance use disorder. Moving on to treatment barriers and gaps, and I know we have 15 more minutes. Um, so we've got three more sections that I'm gonna go pretty quickly through. All right, common barriers to treatment. Uh, first one I have here, um, culture and stigma. So although there is significant variation across cultures, men are more likely to have access to substances relative to women. And this difference appears in access, appears to account for much of the gender difference in substance use worldwide. Um, for, the S for the US right now, the prevalence of SUD in men and women is almost the same. Uh, SAMHSA in 2021 shows that the US is at the top of the world with female SUD at 14.6%. Um, 23.8 percent of females ages 18 to 25 had SUD in 2021. I know I mentioned that age group earlier, but wanted to give you the exact rate of SUD for that age group. Our culture is also conducive to putting women against each other, uh, living competitively versus lifting each other up. We see this on television, social media, and many other places. Um, so we really need to shift that narrative for women helping women. Um, women and men both judge women more harshly. Uh, this is internalized sexism and causes a lot of these issues. So something that we need to work on as a society. And we know that in general, men and women are socialized differently in the U.S. and worldwide. Uh, stigma. So we know that there has been a decreased stigma with the pandemic. In June 2021, 40% of U.S. adults reported struggling with mental health or substance use disorder. So there, so there is that willingness to um, talk about it more. We have work to do still, especially for pregnant women. Family obligations. And this is a big one here, big barrier for women. Um, women typically have older ages of initiation of use compared to men. And this is because more parental exposed constraints, monitoring, and more home responsibility. As a general rule, women who grew up in families taking on adult responsibilities as a child, including household duties, parenting of younger children, and emotional support of parents are more likely to initiate drug and alcohol use. Women in general put their recovery and self-care second to their children and their significant others. Also, if the family doesn't heal, they may have the same expectations from the person returning home from treatment, which is not gonna be conducive to sobriety. For this purpose, pushing family group and family education is really big for women in treatment. So um, to help out their loved ones understand what's going on. Lack of resources is huge. Um, relative to men, women in SUD treatment consistently report more severe issues with employment, social, family, medical, and psychiatric functioning. They also report poor levels of overall quality of life. And several studies show greater legal problems than men. 
Additionally, men are more likely to receive specialized SUD treatment, like self-help groups, specialized outpatient treatment for opioids, whereas women with SUDs are more likely to seek treatment in a mental health setting. Uh, lastly, um, we have complex physical concerns are treated before SUD. Uh, our healthcare system and culture still prioritize physical health over SUD, even though we have made a lot of strides. Um, having uh, BH urgent cares and peers and ERs, um, we have a lot more work to do to continue to push this, especially with older doctors that do not have a great understanding of the disease um, or know how to navigate the system and refer their patient for further care. All right, treatment gaps. So here are some of the necessary wraparound services. There are a ton more that I can name, but um, wanted to point these out. And as we said before, women have multiple complex barriers. Uh, such as the items needed on the screen and the length of support needs to be extended in the US. Um, I've heard some others in the field say that we need to grant access to programming for up to five years. You know, we think in such short intervals sometimes due to uh, Medicaid reimbursement, but thinking about a longer term um, engagement period, especially with women um, that have a lot of barriers as needed. We need better collaborations to promote integrated wraparound services for the complex needs of women. Uh, we need to better be able to offer behavioral health care on site and easily refer or partner with other social service agencies for support. All right, treatment experiences. So emotional experience and treatment. Women typically have a self-reported and often more observable higher stress level appearing in a treatment setting. Um, there is a greater initial decline in women in happiness and self-esteem in the first year of recovery compared to men. Uh, again, a greater initial decline in women's happiness and self-esteem in the first year of recovery compared to men. If that's an important one. Um, generally, women tend to be the happiest in the early years of their lives, and then the most unhappy when they're 40 and 50. And then when they reach 50, um, it peaks again. So it is a U-shaped curve, but there's a lot of anxiety and depression at the bottom of that U. And those ages, we think about premenopause, menopause, a lot of life transitions during that period. Um, for men, age 50 is when they're the unhappiest. Also due to women's tendency to be relationship driven while experiencing many new and frightening emotions during early recovery, women may have an increased chance of pregnancy during treatment. Um, I haven't seen a lot of, I haven't done a lot of research on this, but I know that we have seen this at least in my county. Um, and women may be seeking validation from a male counterpart while in early recovery, and they are processing many more emotions than they did while using. Um, this can be a coping mechanism and a way to self-soothe. Uh, hence, it's very important to have sexual health education and sexual test se STD testing in um, outpatient treatment, but you can incorporate it in any aspects of treatment. Uh, physical experiences during treatment. Uh, so body image is huge for uh, women that are entering early recovery, and many women are uncomfortable with themselves anyways in their bodies. Um, then you add weight gain in treatment, and it's not a good combination. So uh, decreased or no use and increased medications in treatment that cause weight gain can be difficult for someone to accept. Also, we know that some addiction habits can transfer over to a sugar cons consumption addiction. We look, let's look at smoking for a minute um, and how this ties in with success rates. So um, women do have a harder time quitting smoking than men do. I know we talked about this before, but women metabolize nicotine faster than men. Uh, the active ingredient in in tobacco is nicotine and differences in metabolism may help explain why nicotine replacement therapies like patches and gum uh, work better in men than women. 
Women also have different responses to substances, specifically rate related to gynecology. Uh, women also have higher risks of relapse, relapse effects. Death from prescription opioid overdoses among women have increased by 400% since 1999, compared to 265% among men. Uh, one in general, men in general are more likely to die and experience an overdose compared to women still, but uh, the women rates are, incre are increasing. All right, six minutes left here. And um, when I do this longer presentation, we do a really fun exercise with some of the best curriculum uh, practices here, evidence-based evidence practices. Um, these are the ones that I recommend. These are the ones that I helped, uh, helped me develop this presentation. Um, feel free to, uh, I think you'll get these slides afterward if you'd like them, but I just wanted to point some of the ones um, that I've used in the past out. Um, best practice reminders here, and um, always use trauma-informed care, uh, treating both mental health and substance use disorder, making sure you're integrating that, um, setting clients up for long-term support if possible in your area, always keeping barriers that women have in mind and always being kinder than necessary about some of the barriers they may have. Um, Always keep the male versus female differences in mind and um, knowing and using the evidence-based practices that we have available to us. Uh, here is my contact information. Um, hopefully this was helpful for you. I really appreciate your time and you being here with me. Um, I am open to any suggestions or comments on this material and how I can make it better. Um, but thank you so much for, for being here, and I hope this was helpful. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you so much, everyone. We do have one more poll that I need to share with you guys. This has two questions in it. Um, would you want to obtain in-depth training on substance use disorder and women history use and treatment? And then the second question is, how would you like to participate in this training, in person, virtually, or neither? Um, if you enjoyed this training, we did put some reminders in the chat. Thank you, Jen, for putting those in there. Um, we do have a link to a, our post-event survey. Please make sure you click that link, or you will also be redirected once we close out the meeting. Um, it only takes two to three minutes, and this year, guys' feedback does allow us to provide free trainings to you all, so please make sure you fill out that survey. Uh, another reminder, as long as you attended the full one-hour session, you will be receiving a certificate of attendance. Those will be sent out via email within about two weeks, and then um, if... If we continue on this discussion, make sure you're on our mailing list. Check out our website. Um, we have so many great resources on our website. So I'm going to end this poll. I did see that we had a couple questions come through. So I will make sure we document those questions and we will get Ashley to respond to those. Um, and I will send that out via email. So without any other, thank you so much, Ashley, for all your work on this. This was a great webinar. Um, I'm not sure if you noticed in the chat, everyone's thanking you and praising you. Great feedback, great information. Um, so thank you all. Please make sure you fill out that post-event survey and we hope to see you on an upcoming webinar. Bye all.